Welcome to chapter 17. Uh, in this section, we're going to discuss what you might see are called protein synthesis. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as the central dogma. Sometimes it's referred to as transcription and translation. But basically, this is going to be where we take DNA and the code that's in the nucleotides that it contains, convert it to a nucleotide code of RNA, just a slightly different nucleotide, uh, and then eventually we use RNA to convert it to an amino acid code, which will build a protein. And so this is going to be how our body is able to take the information that we have and convert it to the proteins that we need to actually function. And so starting off, we're going to discuss basically transcription and translation, those two processes. And I'm going to focus on transcription first. But to appreciate transcription, you have to understand what we're transcribing. And so in this case, we have two scientists, Beetle and Tatum, that studied these kind of screw-ups in the digestion of many organisms. So we have where there's this bio biochemical pathway, this conversion, where substrate A is converted to substrate B, substrate B is converted to substrate C, substrate C is converted to substrate D. And they would study these guys called oxytrophs, which were mutants, they were screw-ups, they could not convert A to D. And they tried to figure out, well, what's going on with that? And they realized that some of these oxytrophs had where they couldn't convert A to B, but if I added B and kind of dumped it in their container, they could convert B to D. That could manage that. There were other oxytrophs that can convert A to B and C to D. They just couldn't convert B to C. And then lastly, some can convert A to C, but not C to D. So they realized that essentially every time there was a mutation that screwed up their digestive process, it only screwed up one enzyme. And so they came up with this one gene, one enzyme hypothesis, which was pretty solid. Uh, we've modified it now, but in general, they're the first ones that kind of associated what a gene actually did that gave us a phenotype, gave us some type of expression. And so nowadays, we've modified to realize that it makes a protein, and not all proteins are enzymes. Some are, but not all of them. And then from there, we realize that some proteins are actually made up of multiple polypeptides, so it appears that ultimately one gene produces one polypeptide. That polypeptide might be a protein, or it could be a piece of a protein, because there are proteins that are composed of multiple polypeptides. And so if those polypeptides are non-identical, we need multiple genes to build a single protein in some cases. So this is where we've kind of expanded from. And then just a quick reminder, so we start off with the DNA. That's what holds the gene in question. That gene will be transcribed to become RNA, specifically mRNA, if it's the one holding the code for the protein. And then that mRNA will be read by a ribosome. Uh, and then this whole translation process occurs, which will allow us to get our polypeptide. Uh, and when we stick them together as needed, will allow us to get the proteins that we need. Now, the triplet code. Uh, if you can't figure this one out, we're going to have problems here. Uh, triplet 3. So we're going to call codons these triplets, uh, that's what we're going to refer them as, as codons, and these are going to be three nucleotides together. And so I like to think of them as words, but really what we mean is three nucleotides together codes for one amino acid. So if you look at the DNA or the mRNA, you will see that if you read them in threes, you'll be able to build, you'll be able to figure out how to make the protein that they code for. Now, I do want you guys to be able to convert from DNA to mRNA. And so just remember that this is normal. C goes with G. So you can see here, CAC becomes GUG. And you'll notice it's just like before, except the only trick is wherever you would normally put a T, which is in DNA, you would put a U if we're talking about RNA. So if I was converting this, CAC would be GTG if it's DNA. Well, if I'm doing the mRNA version of it, it's going to be GUG. And so it's this conversion process is transcription. That's where we take this DNA sequence and convert it to an RNA sequence. And that's one of the first things that we're going to talk about. But you need to be capable, if I give you a sequence of DNA, you should be able to convert it to another sequence of DNA. That'd just be the complementary bases. That would be replication. You should be able to convert it to RNA. So that would be transcription, where you just make sure you're swapping out those T's and U's. Uh, and then ultimately, if I give you a chart that shows you like what each codon correlates to as far as amino acids, you should be able to correlate it to the appropriate protein it would build or the appropriate polypeptide. So I just want you guys to think whenever you're looking at DNA or RNA, just think threes. 
codons, triplets, whatever you want to think of it, but think that I'm going to look at it in terms of threes. Now, transcription, the process itself, is going to be run by this enzyme RNA polymerase. That's the guy right there. Now, RNA polymerase is kind of cool in the sense that we don't have all these enzymes we had in replication. We don't need topoisomerase and helicase and then DNA polymerase and RNA primase and all. We just need RNA polymerase. That's it. RNA polymerase is going to go in there. It's going to grab the DNA. It's going to pull it apart. It's going to make an RNA copy of a section. But as soon as it keeps going, you're going to see this RNA piece is actually going to fall off and just dangle. And that allows the DNA to go back and affix to itself. And so when we're done with this process, the DNA will look just like normal. It's like nothing ever happened. The RNA polymerase just sneaks through, makes its own copy, and then the default, the template, the DNA, is just like nothing ever happened. And the promoter is going to be the start of this process. So if we look at our gene, our gene is going to have a coding sequence, the part that we're actually going to make into a protein, the part that we're actually going to transcribe, so that's going to be our transcription unit. It's going to have a promoter, which is the start of this, and it's going to have a terminator, a terminator, which is the end of this. So a promoter says, like, here's the beginning of the, of the gene of the protein we're coding for. The terminator says, you got it, we're done, detach. And so that way the RNA polymerase knows when to quit, when to detach, and so when to let everything separate out. And so this process has three parts that we'll quick discuss, initiation, elongation, and termination. Initiation is going to involve these protein transcription factors. We've talked about these before with cell signaling, uh, where these transcription factors are oftentimes produced or activated in response to some cell signal saying, do this. And so they will bind to one of the coolest sequences that's right before the promoter upstream uh, called the Tata -ta box. And so this is a specific region that's right before the promoter that allows for these transcription factors to bind to let RNA polymerase know where to go. We don't want all of our genes on all the time. And so one way to control that is that most genes will only be transcribed if the transcription factors are present to indicate that it should happen. And so RNA polymerase is going to be looking for these transcription factors, and if it sees them, then it will bind to that promoter region so it can start this process of transcription. So initiation is just going to be this beginning part. Elongation is once it's bound, it then moves along the DNA, and it's going to make a copy. It's going to make an RNA transcript from the DNA template. So from one of those strands, and this will occur in the 5 to 3 prime direction, it's going to go along, and it's going to just build the RNA based upon the complementary basis. And you'll see at the end, even though they've got this kind of dangling weird, uh, it should be dangling the back end here, but even though this, you're going to see that the RNA will start to kind of dangle off. And so it doesn't stay connected to the DNA. It's going to attach the complementary base pairs, but then as RNA polymerase moves past, those RNA base pairs will kind of fall off, allowing the DNA to rebind. And this process will continue until it reaches the terminator sequence, where all these things break apart. And so we now have our polymerase off by itself. We've got our transcription factors separated. We've got the RNA, or the mRNA in this case, if we're using it to build the protein. This will be our mRNA that's separate. And the DNA, you can see, is back to normal. So at the termination sequence, we just kind of say, all right, everything's done. Everybody separate. And then if there's continued signaling, this process can continue again. You know, you can continue transcription. Uh, but for that moment, the whole process as it was is officially over and everybody's on their own. Now, if this was a prokaryote, we'd be done. In prokaryotes, their DNA is in their cytoplasm. Their ribosomes are in their cytoplasm. And whenever a ribosome can attach to an mRNA, translation is on. It's going to start. So in the case of prokaryotes, they can actually start translation before they're done with transcription. As soon as some of the mRNA is kind of dangling off there, there are ribosomes that will be like, rock on and go after it. Now, for eukaryotes, we have a nucleus. And so because we have this nucleus, there's a barrier where the ribosomes are outside the nucleus, the RNA is inside the nucleus, so we can control this process better. And so in eukaryotes, we are going to have this post-transcriptional process, oftentimes also called RNA processing that will occur, where we can kind of mess with our RNA piece before we officially let it go to be translated. And so what usually happens here is in a gene, 
In a eukaryote, there's oftentimes these sequences called introns that we don't really want. They're not necessary to make the protein. Uh, we don't want them coded. So I like to think of these where you're watching your favorite TV show. These are like the commercials, where you'd love it if they just got spliced out. And so we literally have a process called splicing where we cut out these introns, and it's done by a protein complex that's really ridiculously named a spliceosome. Wonder what that does. Uh, and so the spliceosome will go through and cut out these introns, and so at the end we'll be left with just a sequence that's made of exons. And then that is what will officially leave via the nuclear pores to go to the cytoplasm where it can be translated. Now there's a little bit more to this though. So aside from just removing these introns with the spliceosomes, which this is kind of showing here, to make our final only exon piece, we also want to protect this mRNA because there are chemicals, enzymes in the cytoplasm that will gradually break down RNA molecules. So they will not, like mRNAs, will not last out there indefinitely. They'll have a lifespan of perhaps hours or days or maybe weeks, but they will not just sit there doing translation forever, which is kind of a good thing. It helps control this process. But we do want them to be able to make it for a while. So on the five prime part of the mRNA molecule, we're going to add what's called a guanine cap, or the five prime cap, which is a guanine that we just tack onto the end as protection. On the three prime end, we add what's called the poly A tail, which is hundreds of adenines that we just tack onto the back end. And so this helps make sure that the mRNA is not going to just go out there and too quickly degrade before we can use it for translation purposes. So beyond processing just in terms of adding uh, the tail, adding this head region, uh, in beyond just removing introns, it's all these things together that ultimately says we now have a finished product that can go out into the cytoplasm and go through the process of translation. We're ready for this to happen. So only in eukaryotes this process will occur where we're going to process it. And so we've got our five prime cap. We've got our three prime poly A tail. And we've removed our introns. That'll be the processing step. At this point, once it leaves the nuclear pore, translation is fair game, and that's what we're going to pick up with next. So I'll see you with that tomorrow.